My name is Simon and this is how to build a racing car. There has been one detail on the car which has been planned since long before I started building it. I'm talking of course about the under tray which is shown in almost all of the renders that I've produced. I was rushing to get ready for the season so it had to be cut from my plan simply to allow me to compete, which was disappointing as the car was designed around this feature. Finally though, the under tray is on the car and we can take a closer look. First though, let's take a step back and look at a typical Formula V. A very good engine will provide the car with roughly 52 kilowatts at the wheels, which is a tiny amount of power in racing terms. My goal when I first started conceptualizing the car was to minimize the drag and the wake left behind as much as possible. I always had an under tray in mind, but mostly for drag minimization purposes, not downforce. I'm not an aerodynamicist though, and so very early in the design process I got in touch with someone who is, Kyle from JKF Aero, who I went to university with. You might be familiar with him from his own channel, Kyle Engineers, which focuses on vehicle dynamics and aerodynamics. He did some lapsim work that showed that even for a low powered Formula V, a well designed tray could still reduce the lap times by over a second around a track like Wakefield Park Raceway. The top end speed would be reduced, but overall the lap time would improve through the decreased braking distances, higher mid corner speeds, and faster straight entry. JKF went through a number of design iterations and eventually settled on the design shown in the renders. An absolute behemoth of a thing, far beyond what I initially had in mind, but one that promised about 200 kilos of downforce at 180 k's an hour. During the design phase, I had some input to ensure that the final result was something that I could actually fabricate. I wanted something which was mostly flat or which used simple curved surfaces. Early on I planned to build the mould of the underside to ensure that it was dimensionally accurate, but eventually I changed to a complete foam base which I would simply lay the fiberglass on top of directly. It would be less accurate and the surface would not be as smooth, but simply from a practical perspective I couldn't build a mould as big as what I would have required. I decided it was a necessary compromise. Once I'd settled on the method, I set about creating each foam piece in SOLIDWORKS. I imported the tray into an assembly and then started creating parts to match the design. The parts were 8mm thick sheets bent to match using the sheet metal function. In the middle was a steel plate with two wings that would mate to the bottom of the chassis for mounting. I wanted the bottom to be steel as I had my doubts that the composite foam fiberglass panel could take an impact like would be likely at the track. The steel extended outwards and the foam would be glued onto its top surface with a gap in the middle where the chassis would sit. Once the fiberglass went over the lot, it would become a very rigid mount from the under tray to the chassis. The tray would also bolt to the rear subframe using the exhaust mount as well as the front of the chassis to the floor. These points would need crush tubes and load spreaders made out of aluminium bonded to the foam to prevent the foam from being crushed. The composite panels are very rigid but are not able to take point loads. So wherever one would occur, I'd need to find a way to spread the load. Once I had the foam core pieces drawn, I flattened each using the flatten function in SOLIDWORKS, then assembled a drawing containing the dimensional information I'd need to mark each out. I did this the same way as I did on the foam detail on the bodywork plug, measuring along one axis, marking points at 100mm intervals, and then marking the distance from the edge to that point. Once I had all of the points marked, I traced a line between each to produce the curve. Rather than use the hot wire cutter, I used a hacksaw blade to cut along each line. I did this because the hot wire actually cuts a bit too well. Any small bump will push the wire through the foam. With a blade I found it much easier to trace along the line. Once I had all of the pieces cut, I started gluing them together. I would apply the glue to the edge of each panel, press them together, and then use nails to fix the parts together while the glue dried. The strakes along the bottom of the tray came in very handy here. I was able to basically lay the top panels down on top of them to get the correct curve. I produced the outside two sections first using this method. It became clear just how large this thing was going to be when it took up most of my lounge room. I had no choice though since my garage had the car taking up all of the space. The sense section came next. I was able to set up the hot wire cutter to cut a straight line and push the panels through to make them the correct width. I then cut the center section where the steel base would go. And finally I applied glue to the steel base and pushed the foam sections into place on top. Once that was all done, I glued the middle strakes in place and nailed the parts together to dry. After 24 hours I was able to remove the nails one by one, leaving a surprisingly sturdy part with the correct shape. Attaching the transition parts was the final challenge with the foam core. I set the middle section and the outer sections up in their correct positions, then set to work gluing and nailing the transition pieces in place. The composite core was now complete. I took it outside to allow me to clean up the edges, ready for fiberglassing. I started with sandpaper and a chisel, but quickly my patience got the better of me and I got the angle grinder out. Once it was all clean and ready, I brought it back inside and set it down on a drop sheet ready to be fiberglassed. 
I pre-cut all of the fiberglass to limit how much I'd need to do once I got the epoxy out. Now here is where I made a big error in judgement. I'd assumed that I'd be able to wet out the fiberglass mat on top of the foam core, so I didn't apply any epoxy directly to the foam core before laying the fiberglass on top. I applied the epoxy over the top of the fiberglass, assuming it would soak through to the foam. I did the entire top surface this way. I'm sure anyone familiar with fiberglassing is just shaking their heads right now, and I am too, because it just didn't bond to the foam very well at all, meaning I ended up having to tear it all off and start again. Doing the entire top surface in one go also meant I wasn't able to get the mat position very well, so it was pulling too tight or too loose in some areas, leaving bubbles and voids. Anyway, a big mistake. Let's move on. The second time around I did a much better job. I changed my method, doing only small sections at a time so that I could really focus on getting them right. I'd pre-wet the surface with epoxy first, then I'd lay up the mat on top and move it into position before it became soaked in epoxy, removing bubbles as I went. Then once I was happy with it, I'd apply epoxy over the top to completely wet it out. Once I was done with an area, I'd apply a peel ply over the top, which would leave the surface ready for another layer, which was necessary to allow me to continue in this patchwork fashion. I went back and did the entire top surface this way. It took a few weeks rather than days, but the result was far better. Once I was finished with the top surface, I brought the tray outside again to clean up the bottom surface. I needed to get rid of the glue runs which occurred when I first glued the tray together. These came away quite easily by slipping a chisel behind the run and parting it away from the surface. In some areas I attacked the join with an angle grinder again, and in some areas I had to get rid of excess epoxy as well. When I'd removed the original fiberglass, I had done some damage to the foam core. This can be seen where the black epoxy had soaked through in a spiderweb fashion. With the surface clean, I set to work glassing the base. The process of fiberglassing something like this is not very easy. First you start by cutting fiberglass into the sections that you require, then you mix a batch of epoxy. It comes in two parts, the base and the hardener. I added a black pigment for the undertray to get the colour that I wanted as well, which was much easier than it would have been to paint it. Once a batch was made, I had about 45 minutes to work with it before it would start to go hard. Doing intricate pieces like the strakes on the bottom of the undertray used pretty much all of that time I had available on each batch. I'd have to fit my hand between each strake and get the brush against the surface, and it was very easy to catch a strand of fiberglass and pull it away. Slowly though, the bottom surface was coated and eventually I finished the main undertray composite part. With the tray now nearly complete, I set to work attaching it to the car. This was a mission in itself. From the bottom, the wheels are the only part of the car not above the tray, which leaves nothing available for lifting the car in order to install the tray. I had to get creative. I made use of the trailer, pushing the car onto it such that the front wheels were just up on top of it. I tied the front of the car to the trailer both forwards and backwards so that it couldn't move or fall off. I then jacked up the rear and put the wheels onto blocks to lift it off the ground. I was able to remove the ramps, leaving the car hanging fairly high above the ground. Next I removed the bodywork and some of the now superfluous parts such as the old aluminium floor and bash trays at the front and rear. I removed the seat, fuel tank and inner floor to provide me access to the attachments between the chassis and understray. I also removed all of the lead from the car while I was at it since it was much easier to access when the car was fully uncovered like this. From there I was able to push the tray under the car. It still wasn't quite enough though, I needed more room at the front to get the tray up and under the nose of the car. So I set the ramps up cantilevered over the back of the trailer under the front wheels of the car. I was then able to roll the car backwards on the ramps to give myself room to mount the tray. Quite the process, I had to take it slowly to make sure that I didn't come into any trouble, but I got there in the end. To attach the tray I set up a jack under the middle to press it hard up against the car. I then drilled holes into the chassis and under tray and installed the mounting bolts. There were a couple of areas where the exhaust runs very close to the surface of the tray, and in those areas I installed some thermal insulation to provide some additional protection to the tray. We're almost there now. There were some fins within the outermost tunnels of the car. I prefabricated a composite panel out of foam and fiberglass, which I then cut into four sections and installed. They were also fiberglassed into position. At the same time I attached mounts for the skid plates that would prevent the tray from being worn away too much if it were to contact the track. Similarly, I attached steel skid plates to the front of the tray with some extra fiberglass to strengthen the area. That completes the under tray construction. It was about three months from start to finish, though I had to fit the construction in between the other races and work that I needed to do on the car. It was on the car just in time for the club round at the end of the year, so stay tuned to see how that performed. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.